Hello, my name is Derek Atkins, and this is part one of a video lecture on telling the better story, sexuality and gender. This video lecture is for the course Church, Society, and Ethical Issues in Asia at the East Asia School of Theology. Have you ever wondered what to say to someone when they tell you that they are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender? Many of us have had this happen to us before. And if you've never had this happen to you before, I'm sure that you will at some point in the future, especially as the LGBTQ and pride movement become, gains more and more respectability in Asian countries. I have two aunts who are lesbian, one cousin who is gay, and I recently found out that one of my cousins, another cousin of mine, has a son who recently came out as transgender. Now, I confess that at times, I have not handled this issue very well. And I suspect that many of you have had similar difficulties. Whether or not you've encountered this issue before, you may not be quite sure about how to navigate this issue. In today's video lecture, we're going to explore the issue of sexuality and gender. This lecture will be divided into two parts. In the first video, we're going to trace the um, origin of the LGBTQ movement, and we'll also examine contemporary understandings of sexuality and gender. Then, once we gain some understanding of contemporary um, ideas about sexuality and gender, we will critique these understandings of sexuality and gender. In the second part of this video lecture, we will look at LGBTQ critiques of biblical teachings about sexuality and gender. And then we will look at what the Bible does say about sexuality and gender. Both of, these, both of these videos will then lay a foundation to help us to uh, develop a strategy for telling the better story about human sexuality and gender. Let's begin by looking at the historical background behind the LGBTQ movement. The roots of modern day understandings of sexuality and gender can be traced to the feminist movement. The feminist movement, also known as the women's movement, has had three and some would say four different waves. The first wave of the feminist movement began in the 1800s and actually grew out of the Second Great Awakening in the United States. The Second Great Awakening spread throughout the United States in the early 1800s, especially in America's Western frontier regions. As many Americans became Christian, they began to not only live better moral lives on a personal level, but they also became concerned about a number of social evils. Thus, the Second Great Awakening gave birth to three major social movements. The first was the abolition movement, which was the movement to end slavery. The second social movement was the temperance movement, which was the movement to outlaw alcohol. And then the third movement was the suffrage movement, 
which was the movement to give women the right to vote. Many women were heavily involved in the abolitionist and temperance movements. And through their involvement in these social movements, women began to realize they were just as capable as men in speaking publicly, organizing for social action, and making moral arguments against social evils. For example, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, which um, really um, highlighted the issue of slavery and showed how evil slavery was. This realization by women gave birth to the suffragette movement, which was the movement to give women the right to vote. First wave feminism was largely Christian in character, and most women who were involved in first wave feminism were Christians. In many ways, the suffragette movement was a profoundly Christian movement and was linked together with the abolitionist and temperance movements. Second wave feminism, which began in the early 1960s, focused on challenging traditional gender roles for women. The book, The Feminine Mystique, written by Betty Friedan and published in 1963, was a popular book that helped launch second wave feminism. In this book, Betty Friedan argued that women of her day were stifled by their roles as mothers and housewives and should break free of those roles to find more opportunities to have more fulfilling lives. Many second wave feminists pushed for laws that required companies and employers to pay both men and women equal salaries, laws allowing both married and unmarried women to have access to birth control products, and laws requiring equality for girls and women in education, including equal opportunities to participate in sports. Although there were many second wave feminists who were rebellious, second wave feminism actually had some good ideas, such as equal pay and equal access to education and sports. However, it was second wave, it was when second wave feminism became intertwined with the sexual revolution and the LGBTQ movement that serious problems began to surface. Second wave feminism began during the sexual revolution. At this time, the pill came out, which made it possible for birth for couples to have sex without having to worry about the possibility of having children. This led to a revolution in people's ideas about sex, which is why this was called the sexual revolution. Sex was no longer seen as something only married couples did. The idea of free love also became popular. This was the idea that people could sleep with whoever they wanted to, whenever they wanted to, and without any kind of commitment. Pleasure became more important than relationship or commitment. At the same time, many states and nations began changing their divorce laws so that couples could get divorced more easily. This was made possible by the adoption of no-fault divorce laws. In the past, divorce law said that one person had to be declared at fault or responsible for the end of their marriage. The new no-fault divorce laws did not declare the husband or the wife at fault and therefore made it much easier for married couples to get divorced. This combination of free love and no-fault divorce laws led to a huge increase in divorce in many Western nations. 
Many in the LGBTQ movement argue that their movement has a long history. And it is true that same-sex behaviors have been part of humanity for thousands of years. Every civilization has had same-sex behavior, including ancient Greece, ancient Rome, ancient China, ancient India, and many other civilizations. Same-sex behavior is even mentioned in the Bible. It is also true that there have been gays, lesbians, and bisexuals even in recent centuries. Famous gays include Oscar Wilde, who was an Irish author, poet, and playwright, Alan Turing, who was the British code maker who helped break the Enigma code during World War II, as well as Guy Burgess, who was a British spy for the Soviet Union. However, the modern LGBTQ movement really had its beginnings in 1969 with the Stonewall Riot, during which patrons at the Stonewall Inn, a gay bar in New York City, began fighting back against police officers during a police raid. This marked a turning point because a number of gays and lesbians became very vocal about pushing for their right, leading to the Pride Movement. The third wave of the feminist movement began in the mid-1990s and sought to build on the successes of second wave feminism. Third wave feminists were influenced by postmodernist ideas that were then being introduced by academics and embraced these ideas. They then used these postmodernist ideas to push the feminist movement in more radical directions, including concepts such as intersectionality, which is now a prominent part of critical race theory, a feminist understanding of patriarchy, and the gender continuum. There are those who argue that the feminist movement has now moved into fourth wave feminism, which began sometime around 2012 and is characterized by the use of internet tools and social media platforms and an emphasis on intersectionality. Intersectionality is a method that is used to define how much oppression one has experienced. For example, if one is a woman and an African or African-American, then one has suffered more oppression than if one is a man and white, Caucasian, or European. Now that we've traced the roots of today's understandings of sexuality and gender, let's dive into what these understandings of sexuality and gender actually are. In the LGBTQ or pride movement, the autonomy of the individual is considered the highest of all virtues. The word autonomy or autonomous has a wide variety of uses, of uses in different situations. For example, we can talk about autonomous or self-driving cars. But in the context of personal rights, Autonomy is the ability to live one's life, a life of one's choosing. In simpler terms, personal autonomy means that individuals have the right or ability to decide everything about their own individual lives, including where one lives. For example, we have laws forbidding discrimination in housing, what job one has, this can be seen in laws forbidding discrimination in the workplace, what medical treatment one receives or doesn't receive. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses have a right to refuse blood transfusions, as, as well as who one marries. For example, we have laws that allow interracial marriage. 
Notice that many of the examples of personal autonomy that I mentioned are rights that the vast majority of people would accept as proper. For example, we all take for granted that we can choose whatever career we want to work in. We also generally accept that people have the right to marry whomever they wish, even if that person is of another ethnicity or race. Also, note that the value of equality complements the value of personal autonomy, because in many cases, unequal treatment leads to restrictions on one's personal autonomy. However, the LGBTQ movement and those who are progressives in general push the idea of personal autonomy to an extreme. They reject all limitations in their right to make personal choices. For example, we see this value expressed when abortion right activists shout, my body, my choice. From a broader perspective, this desire for autonomy is closely linked with the modernist drive to control as much of our lives and environment as possible, okay? Examples of this drive to control our lives and environment include the quest to prolong life as long as possible. While the alleviation of disease is commendable and living a long life does have its place, when this morphs into a desire simply to prolong life because of the fear of death, then we move into the realm of sinful manipulation of life-saving technology. We also see examples of this desire drive for autonomy in the growing practice of women freezing their eggs in order to have the option of having children in the future. Um, this phenomenon is partly because many women feel they can't find men who are good enough for them to marry. But this, um, this phenomenon also reflects the modern day message that women should have it all, meaning they should have a good education, a good career, a good marriage, motherhood, whenever and however they wish. For those who value individual autonomy above all else, there are three forces that they view as enemies of personal autonomy. The first is community because community is seen as repressing individual choice. The second enemy of autonomy is authority, which is seen as placing unnecessary or even wrong limits on personal choices. And then the third enemy of personal autonomy is seen as the sacred, which is seen as outdated and oppressive, serving the patriarchal hierarchy. The LGBTQ movement and progressivism in general rebels against these three forces. Another key cornerstone of LGBTQ thinking is that one's sexuality is the most important element of one's personhood, and therefore, to deny the expression of one's sexuality is to deny one's personhood. This is why the LGBTQ community considers the expression of one's sexual identity the most important act people can do. Furthermore, those who promote the LGBTQ ideology claim that gender is a continuum and is therefore fluid. According to this idea, everyone is a blend of masculine and feminine genders, with some people being predominantly masculine, some being people being predominantly feminine, and some people being somewhere in between. This concept of gender fluidity does lead to conflict within the LGBTQ movement because for many years, 
gays, lesbians, and bisexuals have argued that their homosexual or bisexual orientation is something they were born with and is therefore part of their very nature in much the same way as people cannot help what race they are. This was, in fact, a major argument for the LGBTQ movement for many years, the argument being that gays, lesbians, and bisexuals shouldn't be denied the same rights as others because their homosexual or bisexual orientation are simply something they're born with. In other words, they didn't choose to be this way, just as people don't choose whether to be red, yellow, black, brown, or white. However, in recent years, the LGBTQ movement has been focusing a great deal on promoting transgender rights. And this has created problems because transgenders can and do choose which identity best expresses who they are and because gender is fluid. These sexual identities can and do change. For example, children in schools that teach an LGBTQ curriculum are taught that they might feel like a boy one day and on another day, they might feel like a girl. Finally, the LGBTQ movement demands that everyone affirm their, their LGBTQ identity. It is not enough to simply tolerate their identity. Instead, they insist that everyone must affirm and even celebrate their identities as LGBTQ individuals. Why is this so? Many in the LGBTQ movement say they want affirmation because without this affirmation, they feel threatened by the non-LGBTQ majority. They point to past hostility toward LGBTQ people to support this reasoning. They argue that when others bully them because of their LGBTQ orientation, they are at greater risk for mental illness and even suicide. There is some truth in this claim, but another possible reason why the LGBTQ movement is so insistent that others affirm and celebrate their sexual identity could be that they are trying to suppress the voice of conscience within themselves. And what I mean is, whether they realize it or not on a conscious level, or whether they honestly believe there is nothing wrong with their lifestyles, every LGB LGBTQ person has a conscience, however deeply it may be buried. And that conscience, placed there by God himself, is convicting them of their sin. But if everyone affirms and celebrates their identities and behaviors as positive goods, then that voice of conscience just might be drowned out. So this ends the first part of this video lecture. Um, so we, what we've done is we've looked at the history of the LGBTQ movement, and we've looked at some contemporary understandings of gender and sexuality. So in the second part, we are going to look at some LGBTQ critiques of biblical teachings about gender and sexuality. And then we're going to look at what the Bible actually does say about human sexuality and gender. And all of this in both of these videos will help us to lay the foundation for working out a strategy to tell the better story about sexuality and gender. So please go to the next video and continue this lesson.